Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Society, the art and science of Watts Collection. Uh, today what I want to talk about is the whole issue of constant force. Uh, by constant force I mean a force that will consistently push through the gears and down through the escapement and the pallet fork and up to the uh, balance wheel and then back down and up and keeping the time for us. And the, the problem is, I, I think you can probably see it better than anything, if you take a wind-up toy and, and when you get it wound up, uh, it goes zzz, zzz, really quick and then near the end it's a zit, zit, zit as the power from the uh, tension from the wound-up spring. Well, the same thing happens uh, with watches, but there are a lot of other things that will get in the way. So anyway, so that's what we're going to talk about today. I wanted to give you some examples of watches. Unfortunately, just about all of the watches we're going to look at, with one exception, are fairly expensive. I found one that's very affordable if there's one of the things that you want. Okay, now the whole issue of a, the first one we're going to look at is called the Remontois uh, d'Egalité. And then this means the sort of rewinding for to get, a, to get the pressure equal all around. And basically what a Remontois d'Egalité does is that it winds something up, a smaller spring, spring like basically a glorified hairspring, it winds it up. And then it lets it unwind, and it's the one that's going to uh, move the escapement and so on up and down the line. And what it will do is that these the smaller spring is is rewound regularly by the main spring. Um, this one, this particular one here, is by uh, Derek Pratt. This is Remontois. Derek Pratt. Uh, was a close friend of George Daniels, and they used to communicate a lot. They were both English, but uh, Derek lived in Switzerland and did most of his work there. And he did a lot of the work for um, Urban Jurgensen. So a lot of the things that they had were because of him. Now, this was one thing that is the Rimantois that that he developed was co-located with the escapements, a very interesting one. Uh, Remontois can be just about anywhere, not just about anywhere, but pretty much somewhere along the, uh, the wheel train down to the escapement. And so he put the, the, he put them both with, here you have the escape wheel and then underneath you have a spring. I don't know if you can see it there or not. So anyway, so Pratt, his main task, this is it over his entire career, was a recreation of John Harrison's H4. This was the, the last of the marine chronometers that Harrison made. These were very important for navigation in the British Navy, which was, of course, a very big thing. So this is one they have, and there's a little thing down there It just sort of kept rewinding. Uh, so that it would, no matter what was pushing, it was always at the same constant speed. Okay, so let's take a look at some watches with a uh, uh, Rem and Toy Galate. They're all expensive. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. These things, I've wanted one for a long time. I haven't been able to afford one. And um, so I'll just have to wait until one comes along that I can't afford. Uh, Andreas uh, Streller, his, he really, his stuff is just amazing. I think his, this, um, this particular one is a transaxle Remontois Tourbillon. It's, I think it's north of $100,000. Uh, Gerwil Forse, the differential egalite. It's interesting. Uh, a few years ago, uh, three of us watch collectors, we were hanging out at the uh, Watch Time show. And Stephen Forsey came over. We were at a little table, and we just started, you know, talking. Uh, or we were sort of off business things and just talking about watches. 
And, and I asked him about it. I said, do you guys ever do a, an egalite, a rheumatoid egalite? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, we have one. And he told me all about it. And I said, you know, this thing it seems one of the one of the few sort of, I'll say, fixes that really works to keep really good time with traditional uh, mechanical watches. He said, yeah, it is. And I said, well, how come more people don't use it? And, he, and he, this is why. He said, it's really hard to make one. It's very hard. You have your mainspring, you got your your hairspring with your uh, balance, and then you're putting another spring in between them. He said that's it's, it's really hard, and that's why they don't see a whole lot of them. And the ones you see are expensive. Uh, a relatively new one is a 1941 uh, Remontois by uh, the Gronfeld brothers. Now, 1941 is more the style year. Uh, this was just done, I think, I don't know, four or five years ago uh, by, by the Gronfeld brothers. And I like this one. It's a very clean one. You can see about nine o'clock, there's a little window and you can see the rim and toit. Um, the first one I knew about was one by F.P. Jorn. Doesn't mean it was the first one it was done, simply the first one I knew about. And it's in a, uh, a what's called the Chronomet Optimum uh, by F.P. Jorn. And up about 11 o'clock, again, there's a little rim and top there that gets rewound uh, as the watch runs. Uh, there's another one by F.P. Jorn and probably some of these other guys too uh, that combines a rim and with a tourbillon. Interesting stuff. Now, this next one is addressing the same issue, but in a little different way for trying to get a constant force. If you look at a, imagine a, a, a hairspring or a mainspring is really an S, when you, if it's totally unwound, it's just S-shaped um, piece of steel, really, a little sort of flattened wire. And the, the amount of power that it puts out at any one time will vary. At the very beginning, it's very strong, and near the end, it's not. And so one of the things, or one of the solutions they had, they said, well, why don't we pick the middle part that's most consistent? It's not too strong, it's not too weak. It's sort of the Goldilocks, just right uh, part of the mainspring to use for the watches. And they said, well, the problem is, is how are we going to do this? I mean, how are we going to set it up so that it just uses this first part? Now, this is has it on two ends. First of all, in winding it up, you don't wind it up all the way. You leave about 20% unwound. On the other end, you cut it off about 20%. So that leaves you with about 60% of the total amount in between. Uh, there's a there's the Geneva stop work is also called a Maltese stop work because there's a, a piece of metal a, a gear I guess a shape that looks something like a Maltese cross not exactly and the way it works you can is that I have a little graphic I hope it hope it's animated a little animated graphic what happens is that you have this thing called the finger, and the finger goes around, and when each time it comes around, it goes into a little gap, and then it goes again. Now imagine the part that, that's the finger is the, the, um, the barrel, winding barrel. So you wind it up, and the Maltese cross and finger together will let you wind it up to 80% of its capacity. And then when it comes unwound, it goes to the last 20% of the total spring. And the what the animation shows, it goes around and around until it hits that part of the Maltese cross that doesn't have this little dip in it, and it stops it. This is why it's called a stop work both for winding and unwinding. So that's another thing that's sort of cool. Now, I I went looking for them. Now, there's one, uh, Dornbuth and Unsunda 
have a watch called the Quintus. This watch is about 20,000 bucks. It was for Dornbluth and uh, Unsundes. Is that's a little that's pretty hefty for one of those watches, but they do make good watches. And the other one I found was Constantine Chaikin. Now, most of you probably know Constantine Chaikin from the googly eyes kind of watch that he's done. Uh, he's really a, a really excellent watchmaker, and he did one called the Cinema. And in the Cinema, there's it has a little animation uh, using figures from, um, I'll call him Edward, it's, it's not exactly called Edward, but a guy named Muybridge, who in the history of, um, of, of animation was a huge guy. So he made a, he made a watch with a little cinema in it, a uh, Muybridge type of cinema. And then in that, he put a stop work. That's sort of interesting thing, I thought. Now, the next one is probably one of the most popular ones, and that's the Tourbillon. You know, you can <laughs> I used to say you can swing a dead cat and hit a hundred of the Tourbillons, but I won't say that. Uh, they're very common. They're very expensive at the same time. A Tourbillon essentially was developed for a pocket watch. You get your pocket watch in here, and your pocket watch I will say the crown is up here, the winding crown on a typical pocket watch. And it's going to be like this the whole time. Now, that means that the gravity is going to pull all of the elements of the movement down in one direction. And so I think it was Abraham Breguet developed the tourbillon and thought, well, he'll have something in there so that it'll move the escapement around to different positions and so that uh, the the whole escapement and the balance will be in different positions rather than just in this upright position. Well, uh, they it became very popular. A lot of people thought, boy, I want to have those in a watch. And <laughs> trouble is, is that they're very difficult to make and very expensive to make for the most part. And so they became sort of a super luxury item. And there was some debate like, you know, what do you need one for? This Your your watch is, goes in all different kinds of directions. So, I mean, it does what a tourbillon does anyway. And so there's been some, lots of discussion about it. Uh, one, F.P. Jorn came out one that instead of sort of flat uh, on the on the uh, watch dial, it sticks out like this. <laughs> it's called a, and it's called a vertical uh, tourbillon. Well, this one is Streamliner Tourbillon. I happen to be a big fan. I like the H. Moser Streamliners. I can't afford one, but it doesn't mean I don't like them. Uh, this one is $109,000. That's It's also in gold, which doesn't help the price <laughs> a bit. Uh, but some years ago, I wanted to get a regulator. It wasn't particularly fond of the whole regulator watch thing. But I thought, well, hey, this looks pretty interesting. I, I'll get one. But then I thought, well, you know, I'm probably not going to use it too much. And so I, I found this place in uh, China, in Hong Kong, called Perpetual Watches. And they have a per one called Perpetual Regulator. And it's a really nice little watch uh, with a seagull in, uh, movement in it that was made for the regulator, which means that everything was on a different, um, all of the subdials were on a different uh, pinion or on a different shaft. And um, so I got it and I've had it for years. It was 200 bucks. It was one of those <laughs> things that just turned out really well. So I noticed that at, at the time that the, the same outfit was making tourbillons and some other watches as well. And so I found this tourbillon. This is this is the bargain. If you if you thought, well, man, I got to have a tourbillon. <laughs> you know, this, this is one I would get if I got a tourbillon for fourteen fifty. Uh, the reason I say if I got one, I'm not sure. You know, it's something that I don't think works as well as one in a pocket watch. But so it'd be cool to have one. So there's the bargain. Now. 
This next one is a double barrel and parallel. Uh, this one has turned out to be a very, very important one um, because what it does, I, I don't have one on now, but the double barrel and parallel is like having two horses on a wagon. Uh, one horse will do the job, but for the same amount of weight and everything else, two horses probably will do a little better job. Now, in a watch with double barrels and parallel, what's happening, you basically have two barrels and two mainsprings, and you wind them up, and they unwind together uh, over a, a central gear so that you don't have two different unwinds, so to speak, instead so they, they run this one gear. What happens is that, i got to remember what, the mainspring is doing is providing the power for the entire gear train so you have all these things and if you have any whistles and bells on it like a, um, a chronograph or something that's a lot more work for it and so if you have them set up in parallel that's like having two horses on the, on a cart one horse can do it but two horses can do a better job with less stumbling, so to speak. I found out something interesting about the Andreas Steller. All of his double barrels are in parallel. His watches are quite expensive, but he really is a big believer in that. By the way, this one, the uh, Sauterel, is by Andreas Steller. It also has, not only does it have double barrels in parallel, you can see up around about 11 o'clock, there's a... Um, Rim and Twa, <laughs> got everything. One of the one of the better deals, I think. Now this is where you can find, I think, a good buy on a double barrel, and this is Schwartz ETN. Uh, they they have a watch called the Small Seconds. The one I'm showing there is in gold, but they also have it in steel. I haven't priced them lately. I did before the pandemic, and they were a steal, but not anymore. I think more and more people are wise to what they are. Uh, finally, the FP Jorn has a Chronomet Souverain. They have several watches that where they have double barrels that are in parallel. Uh, the Chronomet Souverain, this is actually called the Chronomet Souverain Havana, uh, which is a, a special type of, of coloring and everything that they have. I happen to like it very much. I just have a plain one. <laughs> it's, mine's got a white dial and uh, it does have a platinum case. So I'm not poor mouthing the whole thing. Trust me. Now, the final one I want to look at is uh, Agonese Gears. And the Agonese Gears, these were developed by Jean-Marc Viderec. And they, they're a, um intellectual property of Agonor. And that's... I sort of got to know them a little better and what's going on with them. What they have is that they have these gears with these teeth that reduce slippage by having these little springs. Now, I, I know that it's sort of like you put something, if you have something with springs, when you put something between them, the spring is going to hold it in there. Uh, if you don't have, if you just have a regular place where a gear goes in, your chances of slippage are greater. And if you have slippage in your gear train anywhere, uh, you're going to have, you're going to lose time, <laughs> basically. It's going to mess up your timing on it. Now, here are three watches that have Agonese gears. Uh, the first one uh, goes back a way, 2005 or someplace back then by Van Cleef and Arpels, and they have a, there's a, a module in there by uh, uh, Agenor, actually, probably by Jean-Marc, and this, this, it's, this little watch does so many different tricks, and one of the gearings is it is an Agonese gear to make the, to go, to make things go smoother on that. Uh, the H. Moser Company Streamliner Flyback Chronograph Automatic. Now, all of the, there's a revolutionary, really, chronograph movement that's made by Agonor. 
it is really good and so it's in more than <laughs> one brand of watches h moser i think uses it a lot uh fabergé has one with it uh singer has another uh let me see uh, i don't know if there's anyone else but it, the 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 movement is so popular uh that if you get one of the things in that movement they do have some agonized gears now the, the final one is one that i have this is larique this is put together by the larique group and uh we worked with agonor directly and we found out that uh, a small seconds are what they call an eccentric second where you have the second hand is sort of off the main wheel train uh, you can have this funny little movement, so the second hand. And so what they did, they put a, uh, our gearing there, in there has a uh, agonized gear, and so we get a nice smooth one. Now, another watch, and this one is fairly affordable. This is by Chomet. Chomet is a jeweler, and people say, well, it must be a fashion watch. Well, yeah, I suppose it is, with <laughs> patent leather straps and a run of silk. But it's amazing horology. Even though the base movement in this thing is an ETA, there's an agonese module on top of it with double, very nice size um, agonese gears. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's this little thing to the right that in some models is a, is a second hand. In mine, it's a Ferris wheel. And it just, there's this perfect smoothness. And you can see how far off the center this one is. So uh, this is another one with agonies. Unusual places that you can find these, uh, these different types of elements to provide constant force. Okay, well, uh, that's... <laughs> quite a bit, I guess, about constant force that we have, but I'd like to hear what you think. Want to know if you have a, a watch with some kind of constant force feature to it. It's an opportunity to subscribe if you like. And until next time, this is Bill Standard for Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collection.